Welcome to another episode of the Swords and Sports Podcast. I am your host, Mike Moogs, the man embarking on a 52-week, 52-book, 52-podcast journey. This week, I am joined by the oft-mentioned star of the self-published fantasy world, the man who wrote the intro music to this song, award-winning author Michael R. Fletcher. And by award-winning, I mean he literally won an award one week from the release of this podcast, which was totally unintentional when I was interviewing him. He's also a Smith Bow 6 finalist and the last Smith Bow 6 finalist I'm going to have on the podcast. If you look back on the interviews, you know who's missing. As a quick self-promo, you can find this podcast on all your podcast listening platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Stitcher, whatever the hell that is, and wherever else you find podcasts. Also, you can find this on YouTube. I've been putting out some of the YouTube videos. Shout out to Ryan DeBruin, who was an awesome guest and put around that YouTube video of the interview from last week. It's a lot of fun doing the videos. I'm having a little trouble with the audio. I know it's not great on that video, so I'm going to keep working to bring out the best content with the best amount of quality that I can do. But I make no promises because I'm just a simple man. The interview with Michael R. Fletcher is coming up right after the book details, so stick around. I don't often edit interviews, but some of the shit we were saying was so beyond wild that I think some of it didn't make the final cut. So stick around, because it is awesome. I guess I didn't mention what book we're talking about. I'm talking about his new rising star, or shining star, however you want to call it, Blackstone Heart. Obviously, the author is Michael R. Fletcher, who is slowly and subtly taking over this entire podcast, despite it being a one-man show. The series is The Obsidian Path. This is book one. Book two of The Obsidian Path, I believe, is coming out next week. Or maybe, if not next week, uh, the week after that. But soon. This book was published on March 29th, 2020, so... Two weeks into our lovely pandemic, it is 390 pages on the paperback. And I want to say something about his covers. He gets that guy that, like he's a guy, Felix Ortiz, he does amazing covers, award-winning covers, and, you know, he does covers for a lot of different fantasy authors. There is a version of this book that has the blacked out version of the original cover, And it is probably one of the sickest covers. Like, just going all matte black with it is such a cool idea as an alternate that I'm obsessed with it. And for the books in the series, we've got Blackstone Heart, obviously, because this is the Obsidian Path, the first step along the Obsidian Path, similar to how I say this is a stop along the 52 fancy book journey. And then the sequel is going to be She Dreams in Blood. If you're wondering what award... This book is won. It is won recently. The Book Nest Award for Best Self-Published Novel in 2020. How crazy is this? I think they've been doing this award four years or five years. Here are the winners of that award. Ben Galley, former guest of the show. Dirk Ashton, future guest of the show. Rob J. Hayes, former guest of the show. I'm not saying that there is a connection there or that... There is a common theme, and it's certainly not that they're fancy writers, it's that they're golden guests of the show. So if you're looking to win that award, this is a good first step for you. It also is a Smithbo Award nominee for the best fantasy book in 2020, and it is performing extremely well in the competition. So, as a heads up, this book will be spoiled in this podcast, so... If you haven't read Blackstone Heart yet, please be warned, there are spoilers in this. There's also spoilers for Michael's life. I don't know if you were planning on watching that movie, but it's spoilers for that. So if you haven't, you know, watched the forthcoming documentary on him that I'm sure he's producing in one of his 9,000 different projects, be warned, spoiler warning. Without further ado, the man, the myth, The Legend, which is a very corny way of introducing one of my favorite people, Michael R. Fletcher. (laughs) 
He's back. I am beyond excited to bring back one of our all-time favorite guests, the one, the only, Michael R. Fletcher, author of Spiffbo 6, finalist, Blackstone Heart, which is book one of the Obsidian Path. And he is also one-fourth of the Wizards, Warriors, and Words podcast. Welcome back. Well, thank you for having me back. I actually, I consider myself more like a 16th of the podcast, but to be fair, I think Jed is like, he's about 80% by himself and the rest of us, we just split up what's left. Or you're one of one of the podcast because you're all oh, the yeah. same person. Yeah, that yeah. Too. Except, for, except for Jed, he's too young and way too cute to be me. <laughs> he is a pretty cute looking kid, you know? Um, <laughs> so it's you, so, so strange. Are you concerned that if you keep doing things that no one's going to be able to introduce you and have time to ask any questions? <laughs> if, we get a, if I get enough stuff sort of going all at once, yeah, it would be like, we just, you can roll through what I've got coming out and then we'll be like, thank you, good night. And that's all folks. Check out him on Amazon. Uh, honestly, as I was going through all the stuff, I was like, he's got a lot of shit out. Oh my God. Take this time to plug it. Yeah. This, oh, this time? Uh, I ha- I has books. <laughs> yeah. right, done. I was able to wrap that up pretty quick, actually. Nailed it. Nailed there it. you go. So the sales are flying in. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the sequel coming out to Blackstone Heart on the 16th of April? Yeah, April 16th, which was a about as random a date as you could pick. Uh, I think the book one came out April 1st, and no one believed me. So I was of course. Like, maybe, maybe let's not do that again. Uh, and I really, I mean, because I'm like this uh, marketing publicity genius. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if like the sequel comes out sometime around when uh, the SPFBO like wraps up and finishes but of course being too lazy to actually like find out when that is I was like I bet it's around April like probably <laughs> mid-April so I was like oh yeah there's there's mid-April are, are we gonna do this theme again last time you were on here I think uh, you used the term I'm lazy 9,000 times as you slowly destroyed that image by every single thing that you said after. You're like, I'm lazy, I painted a room. I'm lazy, I built a shed. I'm lazy, I recorded my own audiobook. All right, we'll skip that this time. No, keep it going, we'll, it's beautiful. Yeah, we'll pretend, <laughs> pretend that I'm not lazy. Are you, <laughs> are you surprised? Because you're such a serious guy that nobody believed your book was coming out April 1st. I'm a, I'm a little surprised. It seems like, I'm, like an odd thing to joke about. You know, you kind of like, <laughs> because I, like i had pre-sales set up and it said on amazon like uh shipping april 1st and people were still kind of like oh, he's fucking with us i wouldn't believe you i yeah i thought so you know I, this face look how honest it is it. i mean would... you have the face of like one of those roman senators that's carved in like chiseled with just that straight staring death look <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that you know i debated because last time got so off the rails i debated not even writing an outline for this but i i did so right. let's let's talk about the recent development i couldn't believe that you entered spiffbo and you became a finalist because last time we talked you know obviously that it hadn't happened yet so how's your spiffbo experience been uh, yeah, it's it's been good. I mean, it, it would have been much less good what were I not a finalist. I would have been like, no, this is balls. I hate <laughs> I just uh, entered this because, because sure. the book actually made it into the finals. It's been good. Um, I, I was, uh, I can't remember if we talked about this. I, I was leery. You know, I, I was leaning towards not entering uh, because, you know, the idea of like not even making the finals, I was like, ah, oh, that's going to be crushing. Like, and I'm just... I don't have this sort of like mental fortitude to stand up to shit like that. I'm like, right, right, right. Like, just collapse. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna be like, you know, curled up drunk in a ditch <laughs> somewhere. Which, you know, being a finalist didn't actually stop that. Was, I was gonna say that probably happened anyway. But <laughs> it was probably it was fairly it was destined. But uh, and then with it actually, you know, making it in there, uh, it's kind of it's this incredible thing that Mark does, uh, Mark Lawrence, like. I, 
I am kind of in awe that he has put this together and kept it running and all the, I'm, I'm going to blow some sunshine up some judge, butt. Uh, but <laughs> they read an insane number of books. Like I'm like, I read four books. Yeah. Last year. Like, fuck. Yeah. I got <laughs> down. And they're, you know, like they read 30 each, like in the first couple of months. Like It's uh, nuts, right? Yeah. That's insane. It's too much. I, you know, uh, it's that's a that's a beautiful name drop there. Going, Mark. You know, Mark yeah, Lawrence. Super slick. All right, my good buddy Mark. We were hanging out, and he was like, "Mike, you write the best books." <laughs> oh man, it is insane what those judges go through. Because I've had a few people on who have been judges, and they're like, "Yeah, it's a ton of work." Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. And it is interesting that you mentioned that because there have been authors who have had commercial success that have entered Spiffbo and haven't made it out of the semifinal round. So it is, it doesn't, name recognition doesn't get you anywhere in this contest. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really doesn't. I mean, they're, they're going to read the books and if they like them, you get a good score. And if they don't like them, you don't. And I mean, Blackstone Heart being what it is, some of them don't like it. And that, you know, that's fine. I'll kill them later. Right. I mean, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> what you do? Like, you didn't like my book when you talk. Well, any enemy you leave behind uh, winds up biting you in the ass. <laughs> yeah. True. Uh, but you do have success. And, you know, I know that the Spiffbo finalist groups kind of get all buddy-buddy. So have you been having a great experience meeting everybody? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good group of people. They're like, really supportive um you know reading each other's books and kind of commiserating when bad reviews come in and celebrating together when good reviews come in um they're they're really i i i I come out of this knowing that this group the other nine people of the 10 finalists they're all so much better people than i am yeah you're a real piece of shit (laughs) just better at faking it i don't know I no, like genuinely, they're actually a really good group of people, and uh, there are a couple of books that are really, really good. Really, I'll be like, yeah, if I lose to that, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, at that point, the quality is so high of the finalist books that preference and taste is going to matter more there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, do you feel like the support you get from these finalists is the exact opposite of what you get from your podcast co-hosts? <laughs> well, I mean, we sort of have this um, like intentionally antagonistic relationship. <laughs> um, like I and and I like openly, like Jed is he's really good at planning stuff. He scripts everything. He has topics worked out and questions, and like he 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 puts an insane amount of effort. And before every recording starts, he goes over everything with us, and I stare at him blankly. And at the end, I'm like, "Yeah, sorry, I wasn't listening. Like I caught." <laughs> and then I spend the rest of the episode like intentionally trying to sabotage him and derail things with like wandering off topic and bringing up sort of random shit. And bless him, he keeps that shit together. He's a champ. Uh, yeah, definitely. And if you guys want a great example of this, go check out the chaos episode, which was uh, okay. That obviously, because that was my episode, that was my baby. <laughs> the best episode of all. Time. Uh, yeah, best and maybe the most disorganized episode. <laughs> Hence the name chaos episode. I think so, when we first started talking about it, I was like, oh, Jed, I want to do an episode. He's like, cool. What's it about? I'm like, it's a chaos episode. It's a chaos. <laughs> And let me tell you, it's chaotic, though. I think Jed has the highlight there when he goes, uh, Pawn's Gambit, I think, is the end of Rob J. Hayes' career. It's over. <laughs> you guys have a ton of fun. One of, my, one of my takeaways from the show is you've got beef with Brando Sando, the king. I don't know. There's no beef. I mean, like... You, beef you, sells, Mike. I, I know you're going to gonna try to say you don't have it, but I'm trying to sell a beef here. He is so much just like orders of magnitude more successful than i will ever be so having a beef with that like what am i gonna say like his books aren't like really good and selling insanely well like all right fine they're not my cup of tea but obviously like he is killing it i 
he tells a good story for whatever, you know, like it's not my thing, but the dude is really good at what he does. Well, I don't think there, I think when people aren't eating other people and stuff, that's where we kind of lose you as a fan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, none of that's, none of that's intentional. Like I don't, I I never put thought into darkness. I'm not like, I'm going to write something dark and creepy and gory and disgusting. Like right. Never the thought never crosses my mind. I'm just telling a story and I'm trying to put the reader into the story. Like that's all I'm trying to do. So I don't know, maybe I go overboard on descriptions. It's totally possible. <laughs> or maybe there's just something a little bent and you know, the only kind of story that I'm really interested in telling is the like the fucked up stuff. But I mean right. that's interesting. I I never caught around to doing it because I'm lazy. Uh, but I was going to do my award show because I feel like everybody should have a joke award show. So they feel important, but you won most grotesque passage of the year. So you're also, Uh, you're also probably going to win it again this year. And we'll get to that eventually. And obviously I was kidding about the Brandon Sanderson thing. I'm trying to sell it. Be fair. It's like when I say, you know, I really don't like uh, Daniel green. I think he's terrible for fantasy, you know, (laughs) got to punch up like Mario. Yeah. (laughs) Man, so do you think you're going to be able to make it? You're very close to an incredible milestone. You almost have 10K tweets. Seriously? I, I, I like, I pay no, I like, I'm on social media, but I don't pay attention. So I have no idea how many tweets I have. I don't know how many followers I have. I, I don't care about any of that shit. Uh, I had no idea. I can't believe I had, I said bullshit almost 10,000 times. Well, that's the thing. I looked through all of them and the amount of times you said the actual word bullshit was more than you have tweets. So you're averaging two yeah, bullshits yeah. a tweet. Oh. I'm doing good then. You're like oh, uh, stuff. like my mustard tweet today. Oh my God, genius. That was poetry. I mean, that's why you get the big bucks. Oh yeah, the big bucks. <laughs> it's inside like that. I mean, you have a microphone arm now. You didn't have one of those last time I talked to you. Uh, yeah, no, I, well, maybe I didn't. Okay, that was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah, I got this for the uh, the whole audiobook thing. So I can like chain smoke and drink my whiskey while I'm doing my audiobook and my right. <laughs> voice. Like uh, Kenny Rogers or somebody who is an artist who I don't know a single song of his because I'm 28. Uh, <laughs> and that's how you lose a guest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm so old. <laughs> so last time I had you on was more the idea of it was to go over one book, but really we've got into a more general just overview of all your books because you were one of the few authors whose work I was familiar with before I started doing this. So for the sake of brevity, I want to keep it to one book this time. All right, good luck. (laughs) What are the difficulties in cutting hundreds of throats in a day? Like, what do you do if your forearm starts to cramp? Uh, Yeah, so you have to be on a, a lot of drugs. (laughs) <laughs> um, so that actual scene, that scene is the whole book. The Obsidian Path is based on a decade-long Stormbringer campaign I ran like back in the 90s, right? So a lot of those scenes are literally lifted from the campaign. Right. Not everything, because I mean, who the hell is going to roleplay in that kind of detail? And I can't remember shit like that. <laughs> but that particular scene, that, that, that little flashback uh, that happened in the campaign. And, you know, the main character who was cutting throats, Kren, um, was on an absolute ass ton of narcotics and, and, you know, whatnot to sort of keep him functioning. Because uh, I think it was like three or four days of nonstop, constant sacrifice uh, until he had enough souls stored up to, uh, to summon the god. Well, I'm thinking I would need a water break at some point. Like, I can't even hold a pen. That's what, the, that's what the blood's for, although it's salty, which causes its own problems. Right, and I'm sure, you know, the narcotics. Well, maybe if I was on, you know, I was 22 and back to doing coke all the time, maybe I could oh, get back, that. Back when you were young and 22. <laughs> Just uh, mere six I, years ago. I killed to be 40. <laughs> I killed to be back on co- No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, Okay. Is the best way to disarm someone before you kill them to say, I'm not going to kill you? 
That that's actually a really <laughs> good way of uh, disarming someone. Yes, I always go for distraction. Like never fight fair. That's dumb. You I know, mean, yeah, that's absolutely. What the good guy does, and you're like, no, come on. So you you gotta like, okay, like uh, we can't fight. This is silly. We we should stop fighting. And then the second their sword starts dropping, you gotta stab them in the throat. I. That was actually one of the laughing out loud. I can't believe I just said that in an actual thing. Um, the one of the lull moments of the books was, I'm not going to kill you. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> what goes into a good deception? Because that's the ultimate deception, but there's got to be other ways to disarm someone. Because you know, if I was like, I'm not going to rob you. And then I just take whatever's in your hand and run. That's, I mean, that's pretty fucking smart. Mm, uh, this topic's totally going to land me in shit. They're like, what are the excellent, what are the best deceptions, right? Right. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, religion, politics. Ooh. I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, no, these are all dangerous topics. Dude, what are you doing? This is a I trap. <laughs> the best deception is saying Brandon that Sanderson sent you, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> I think I'd be doing better in life. <laughs> the ultimate deception is taking pre-sales for a book that releases on April 1st and not releasing the book. <laughs> yeah, that would have been good. I, I, in hindsight, I should have done that. <laughs> is there a world where you finish the joke, a necromancer, a demonologist, and a dead man walk into a bar? <laughs> No, some jokes are best left unfinished. <laughs> is Shalayananin, who is a very difficult name to say. Can you please say it for me? Shalane? Are you talking about the swordswoman in Blackstone Heart? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Shalane. I'll never say that one again. So yeah. is is Shalane being a little over dramatic about being mad at him? Uh, you gotta remember. Um, I don't want. I, how much? How much like spoilery shit do we get into here? Oh, we we go all the way in, and I include a huge warning in the beginning. Okay, so we're good. All right. So uh, she's talking to Tian, her sister, the whole time. The wizard, right? Right. And so her wizard, or her sister, is feeding her one line of things, and she believes a lot of what her sister is telling her as well. Um, Book book two, it's it's all yeah. You got April sixteenth. Yeah, I mean, come on, don't be spoiling your own unreleased book. I know. I know. <laughs> Too tempting. Now, I think she's being a little dramatic. Sure, her sister gets killed in front of her, and that might that might cause you to have a little bit of a bad day. Yeah, I mean, like stabbed in the back by your ex boyfriend, you might be mildly miffed. I mean, she might have been. A, had on the melodramatic side might have been a bit much now what's worse the fact that he found a new girl so quickly or that he stabbed her sister and killed her in front of her mm. i'm gonna go with the stabbing i think because i think my ex-co-host would be more mad if about the new girl so quickly <laughs> you know, i was i was wondering where the other co-host <laughs> I I'm going to let that slide. <laughs> it has uh, perplexed a lot of my repeat guests. <laughs> we morphed into one person. Or, you know, if you look in the back of our new apartment, there her body has been. <laughs> <laughs> Is she in the apartment? I can't. I don't know if she's going to first in here and be like, shut the fucking mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever think you're going to write a character who's going to give up on the idea that they're good? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think, see, the, the problem there is everyone kind of does. Like, there are not a ton of people who walk through the day thinking, man, I am just an evil shit stain of a human. Well, you, you know, are. Reasons. You, well, yeah, sure, you, literally, you literally I, said, I'm the shittiest person in this fifth bow finalist group. <laughs> <laughs> True, but I, I was, you know, I was lying. I was just like, false humility is bullshit. <laughs> no one believed that. Um, and so like, even, you know, like you're sort of, um, your, your emperors, your, you know, horrendous rulers, there is something in there 
and where it makes sense to them. Now they can be wholly selfish, you know, but I, they, they still don't go through the day thinking like, you know, maybe I should stop shitting on the common man. Right. They're like, you know, they need me. Right. Like, fuck these people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think it's one of the more human elements of these books uh, and this book specifically where he is trying so hard not to repeat the mistakes of this kind of bit by bit memory that he gets. Yeah. But slowly the idea of I'm never going to kill anyone again, even though I killed a 10 year old like a week ago. Uh, and then I'm not going to kill any women because this old farm woman gave me bread once turns into, well, I want my girlfriend to get hot again. So I got to kill some women. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm totally going to hell for that. How horny is he? <laughs> uh, dude, you have been like 19 years old, right? You know the answer. I would have sacrificed a lot of souls that I couldn't see. Uh, <laughs> drop of a hat. You're like, do I know that person? No, oh, I do. Do I like them? Eh, only a little. Right, they're gone. You know, if I had more listeners of this podcast, I'd be worried that this would be the last episode. So. Yeah. <laughs> I love that concept. Every time he looks at her, every time he looks at Henka, he goes, shit, you know, it'd be great if you were hot again. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think you're being a little unfair to the character. I, there is some background manipulation going on there. <laughs> I'm not entirely aware of and, um, way too young and you know, 19 to uh, sort of comprehend and appreciate. <laughs> I am totally trying to create a narrative here. And I'm <laughs> now my question, uh, I had much fouler questions before I kind of crossed some of them out. So I got to make sure that I don't say any of these. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. End of sorrow. Do you, you are great at coming up with names for gods. You're great at coming up with names for swords. Do you ever worry that you're going to repeat one? No, not really. I mean, there's just, there's, there are so many different things you can put together. I mean, and, and the nice thing with writing is even after the book is done, you have time with it you know, right. before publishing. And, you know, like The End of Sorrow, that weirdly, I had that name before uh, I even started the book. And it's, it's, it's a it's kind of a play on words on the on the actual name of the the demon slash god bound to the sword which is can't lament um but can't lament cannot lament can't be sad no sorrow and it's sort of like this twist on that uh, is how that kind of like popped into my head i was like oh no more sorrow and it made sense with like the end of his empire and his sort of a uh, extremely self-destructive tendencies uh, is basically like an attempt to end all sorrow. Am I dumb for not getting can't lament? For that going right over my head? I, I'm not sure that that's, it's not really, I, I don't think, I can't remember. I, I don't think I really laid it out and explained it in the book, which, I mean, I do that a fair amount where it's like there's stuff in there that means something to me. And I maybe some readers catch it, maybe some don't. And I, I kind of, I don't really care. Uh, so yes, I am dumb. <laughs> thank you that that couldn't have been that couldn't have been any nicer way to say that <laughs> yeah, yeah i am see i'm a super sweetheart <laughs> oh man has what happens if he just puts a random piece of obsidian up to himself does he get like the memories of something else uh no he probably just get cut <laughs> <laughs> now one of the awesome elements is this concept that he gets to kill other versions of himself, which is great. And you have kind of dabbled in this with, you know, your all time excuses letter, which I constantly reference. Um, but in this book, you, he gets to rip out his own heart and then he gets to attach it to himself. Now, when he saw the version of himself that had the better beard and more muscles. Did he think, well, I'm never going to be that good looking. Honestly, he should get it. Uh, I think there was a moment of jealousy perhaps, but he's 
far too selfish a character to ever sort of like give up or let somebody else take over. See, he thinks it's important that he be the one that sort of brings all the pieces together because he thinks he can shape who he sort of turns out to be because he's he's better. He's a better person uh, because well, of his experiences than all the other versions of him will be. They're all going to be assholes and terrible people, whereas he's at least trying to be good. Right, like the version of himself that was peaceful, but that guy didn't have the temptation of using the souls which meant he couldn't possibly feel guilty about using the souls. So he wasn't as a, you know, developed character. (laughs) Exactly. You got to always an excuse, right? You got to walk through hell to go walk in the light. You know, that guy wasn't able to complete his full, you know, arc. (laughs) I don't know if I saw a version of myself that was a little more, you know, jacked up and with a full head of hair, I might be like, I know that I'm supposed to be the one, but God damn, do I miss having hair? <laughs> yeah, could could go that route. Oh, you know what'd be great is uh at the end of the next book, I'll have one of the other Krens kill him and take the stone. <laughs> and everyone would be like, "What the fuck? <laughs> what a fucking ending that would be if that was like the last part." And after all this, he's about to retake the empire, and nope, he just gets killed, and that's it. <laughs> Now, the next series, next trilogy will be uh, the other Kren's story. <laughs> where, the, uh, where the other Kren has just followed him around being like, this guy is such an asshole. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that at some point the wizards were like, I shouldn't have destroyed this empire because things that were way easier to do now are super complicated. I see, I see the, uh, the wizards as sort of like highly insular academics. They're, they're really focused on learning wizardry, on expanding wizardry. They're, they're lifelong students who happen to be immortal. And so like the running of Kren's old empire, it really is kind of an afterthought for them. You know, they do enough that people aren't rampantly starving to death and dying. Uh, but that's that's not really what they're about. They were never like, oh, we're going to take over the kingdom and we're going to be in charge. And it's going to be awesome. They were just like, we got to get rid of the guy on top uh, because he's kind of slowing us down. You know, I have this, I have this debate all the time. If I could go back in time and be super rich, or I could be myself now, what would I want to be? And I want to be myself now because I have an iPhone, and I don't think <laughs> any money in the world. So at some point, they're immortal but there's no street lights. The streets are dirty. They've got to open all their own doors. Were they like, man, we fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. You gotta keep in mind how much more like background world building there is that <laughs> has not made it into the books. Um, the wizards don't need any of that shit. They like, they don't care. They, they live in this entirely sort of like separate picture or like, um, you know, there's a civilization in the mud and then there's all the really wealthy people are living on orbitals and they're kind of running the civilization down on the mud too, but it, they're not really worried about what's going on down there. It's, it's closer to something like that. Right. And I guess that makes a lot more sense when that uh, they're in the wizard's tower. How many times did you make your bed before you thought the ultimate luxury is a bed that makes itself? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because that's high-end living. That's, oh, it's, that's good stuff right there. Yeah, every time you come back, the room's all clean. Everything's been put away. You're like, oh, yeah. That, that's life. <laughs> I just think when he goes to the town to chase that other piece of himself, that town sounds awesome. Everything takes care of itself. Yeah. And the, you got to remember there's the cost there, which the wizards are not paying. It's like, like a few thousand, human. hundred thousand people. Like, who cares? Yeah, it's a <laughs> lot of souls went into that <laughs> and maintained, you know, there's a lot. It's not quite this like goody goody. Oh, it's all, you yeah. look, they've got nice streets and they're, they're lit. It's like, oh, okay, cool. What did that cost? <laughs> well, Kren has that moment as well where he, him and Henka are like, he's like, okay, we're going to find some old whore. And we're going to, or we're going to find some criminals and some rapists and we're going to kill them. And then at the first roadblock, he's like, 
Never mind. This is way too much work. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like he's not a good guy. <laughs> I believe his redemption's coming. But let me tell you, doing the wrong thing and being having it much more convenient, that's a tough sell. It's tempting. <laughs> I've got a few novella ideas to pitch at you. This is, <laughs> this is a new feature of the show. All right. right. Let's hear it. Let's hear it where I pitch incredible novella ideas. I, a version of Smokey the Bear, where it's Smokey the undead grizzly bear, and he goes around putting out forest fires as an undead, uh, like, desiccated-looking corpse. Does he, like, wander into, like, camps, tear people apart, and use their bloody corpses to put out the fire? Because that could go. I, I could go there. Right. So, yeah, he picks the person who's, you know, smoking a cigarette or something, and he throws their body on the campfire. He goes, we don't do forest fires. You're not practicing good fire safety. Okay. All right, that one's not bad. That's a winner. Right. Okay. You haven't copyrighted that yet, have you? Uh, no, I don't copyright anything because I have no creativity. I'm just an ideas guy. <laughs> Why do you think I created a show that reviews books instead of, you know, like working on one? <laughs> 50 Bodies of Grey. A sexual exploration of Henka, where she explores <laughs> her sexuality by taking over other people's bodies and putting them on top of herself. I, th I think I wrote that in book two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's coming across on the microphone. Uh, Mike is just shaking his head, like, "Get me off this podcast! I can't believe I came back on this show with the worst, with the with the bad host." <laughs> I created, a, I created my own segment called Fletcher's Fuckery. And this was based off of some of your grotesque passages, which bring me nothing but joy. Last time, it was Jateko crawling through the entrails of a horse, throwing up and then crawling through that. This time, I've got two great examples, and they get better. The lovers came apart in a bloody explosion, like someone shoved them through a fine mesh filter. A red mist <laughs> sprays all over. What the fuck, man? You're just pushing body through a mesh filter and you're like, this is a great idea. I'm killing this. Yeah, you know, I, the way I write is I see every scene in my head, right? I, it plays out like a movie. And then all I'm trying to do is like put that movie on paper so that my movie, my weird fucked up head movie, plays in your head. <laughs> and... And that's what I saw. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah. This is a wizard who's like, no, enough of this shit. Get out of my way. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the way that shit goes down. There's no great explanation. There's no justice. It's just like, oh, you're fucked, buddy. <laughs> Sanderson's too pussy to write that kind of prose. Um... You know what? I, I recently, uh, in a, a negative review, where someone said, oh, he's just a gritty Sanderson. That probably hurt that's, more than it. That had to hurt. I, I don't know. I'm kind of like, that's awesome. That's hilarious. A gritty Sanderson. <laughs> okay. That's, that's all that differentiates like us. I, so if I could be less gritty, I could be like monster famous. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, all I got to do is take out all the elements that make your books awesome and then they'll succeed. Is that what you're telling me? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> all right. The second passage and... Let me tell you, this might, this is going to win this year if I ever get around to doing that award show and I find that notes on my notes app. <laughs> First, she had me drain the Wizard of Blood, collecting it in buckets I found elsewhere in the village. I then spent hours carving him like an uncooked roast. <laughs> Staring at the legs, I peeled away flesh and then muscle, draping them over the charred remains of Henka's legs and dribbling the gathered blood on them. I watched in amazement as she closed her eyes and focused her power. Blah, blah, blah. She sings. The end wasn't pretty, but she could walk. Next, I cut the mage's arm off at the elbow. Careful not to damage the bone, God forbid. <laughs> Hold it against the stump of the charred bone. Oh, uh, yeah, I want to make sure that you get that up. I watched flesh, muscle, and sinew fuse together as she sang. You know, the hills are alive with the sound of flesh knitting. Harvesting the upper arm for what it had to offer, she now had one working arm. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know 
you make it sound like my books are dark and gory and that's just not fair there's a lot of like really tender moments in there i can't remember any of them off the top of my head uh, but i'm sure there's there's got to be some right like but that that scene i think hopefully it made context uh, made sense in context right absolutely like, damage done damage needs to repair <laughs> This is how a necromancer repairs himself. Now, maybe a lot of writers who are more tasteful than myself would have been like, fade to black. <laughs> oh, she's better. Look, and everything's all knit. And like her back's a little hairy because, you know, they harvested a, some young wizard guy. <laughs> but, and that would have been it. And the, the readers would have been like, oh yeah, cool. I can picture what that looked like. And I'm like, no, you can't. No, you can't. You're Here too it is. Dumb. Let me put it in your head for you. You're too dumb to think of this. So I'm going to lay it out for you. Yeah, the cute moment is when, you know, she has these hairy arms and hairy back, and she just gives them a little peck, like, thank you. <laughs> Adorable. Adorbs. <laughs> That's so cute that Disney might steal that from you, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> what is, does Shallon have the worst go of this book out of everybody? Well, I mean, I mean, some of the people who got harvested might argue otherwise. Uh, but, but they get to know, be a part of like something great. <laughs> surviving characters, I, I think uh, she's fairly hard done by. I mean, yeah, because she's not only did she feel like her boyfriend abandoned her, which let me tell you, that's got to hurt. You know, heartbroken. This is really a teen romance. <laughs> that's supposed how you... to be. It just went slightly <laughs> south. <laughs> A sadistic teen romance. Uh, then, you know, she's got to see that his new girl is hot. Yeah, that, that never goes over well. She doesn't need Instagram filters or stuff like that because she's got the ultimate filter, which is filtering through people's corpses. Yeah, I don't really have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is this horrendous, terrible juvenile fantasy put into a fantasy novel and it is all kinds of fucked up but it's and very all, intentional and all kinds of sexy <laughs> yeah it's that too i'm a, i am amazed by the number of people who are like oh my god i love henka i'm like fuck like lover you i think of her staple chest before i go and do the deep <laughs> okay <laughs> i knew i was gonna go too far at some oh, point yeah. All right, let's let's uh that one's not getting cut out because I don't do any editing, it's too much work. Yeah, the effort. I didn't even edit all those connection issues we had last time. It was just mostly nah, 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 nah. <laughs> book two, April 16th. It turns into the teen romance we were waiting for in the first book. Oh yeah. Everything's hugs and fluffy kittens and romance and sparkly vampires is gonna be brilliant. I'm gonna be in the next. Slightly less gritty Brandon Sanderson. Uh, man, that comment either that comment either hyped you up beyond belief or it's secretly eating at you and you're masking it by this laughter. This no, infectious I, laughter. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess it, it's, it stumps me. <laughs> How you get from Brandon Sanderson to me, I'm kind of like, okay. I, I can't really argue with it. I was like, yes, it is grittier. Right. Well, I mean, that element's certainly true. Yeah, for sure. Michael, I don't know if you've noticed, but most reviewers, most people who review things can only reference it to like three series. Oh, fuck. Yeah. It's like it's uh, Marzipan, Brandon Sanderson, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. What the fuck is Marzipan? Are you... Oh, it's this weird English dessert. <laughs> I thought that was a joke on uh, Malazan. It is. Okay, nailed it. Fuck, man. I am off my game today. This is wow. going poorly. Oh, well. We'll edit that out. We'll play that back. We'll do the same lines again. Just this time you're going to be on it. All right, go. <laughs> Welcome to Sword Sports. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do if you win Spiffbo? Are you going to all go back to that same ditch that you were crawled up in? Oh, fuck. Yeah, but with a you know slightly better whiskey this time. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to finally feel accepted by your peer, Rob J. Hayes? You understand what peers means, right? That's equal. You're, it's a term you of endearment. Be my equal. <laughs> uh, I don't 
no, I have no idea what happened. You know, like I, I can't, I'd be stunned if I, if I land like top three it would be amazing. Like actually winning. I, I, I like, I don't know. I like that. What does it mean anything? Do sales pick up? Do people dance around me going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we could arrange that. You know, regardless of the yeah. results, I Get feel like that. your life, that would happen naturally. <laughs> What does Less Mark time. Lawrence send you? Like a Chili's gift card? My <laughs> Chili's gift card. He's always, he's calling and pestering me. It's just, I'm like, dude, I'm busy. You're like, get a life, man. Like, don't you write books? Get to it. Yeah, like what? You've only put like five or six books out this year? Like, stop slacking, buddy. <laughs> like, what are you, a bestseller or something? This is a joke. <laughs> Would you stand in a flooded coffee shop if the coffee was good enough? And yeah. rats were flying by you. Mm, less with the rats, but they're flooded for really good coffee. Yeah, sure. Do you have a place like that? Is this from experience? Because I'm thinking, like, I love Dunkin' Donuts, and I know that's blasphemous to true coffee lovers, but I wouldn't give a shit if it was flooded. I need that iced coffee in the summer. It's hot out. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, it's it's not a not 100% life experience. I have been in places like that um like underground goth clubs and stuff i used to play in this like a goth metal band and so we played all of the like shittiest basement illegal clubs in the city <laughs> and some of them were a lot like that like less flooded more rats <laughs> well if you're hungry there's always a quick snack there mm -mm. <laughs> you can't put a price on good coffee that was probably the most likable thing about tn I, I liked her. I, I, I had a lot of fun writing that character. She uh, also shares a name with a Dragon Ball Z character, which was cool. I did not know that. <laughs> so are you still playing music? I know that you do the Mad Doppel Band. How's that going? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hobby. I do it for fun. Um, you know, there's no real goal with it. I get riffs, music stuck in my head. Eventually I go, I'm like, okay, shit, I got to get this out and we'll like lay down drums bass guitar tracks synths and stuff and just ground up sort of build the whole thing and then when i'm done uh i will listen to the mix and i'll usually do sort of like a a mastering job on it as well just because i'm always trying to get better at that and i'll listen through and be like oh well, yeah that sounds pretty cool that was better than the last one and then i'll like close it and uh, mostly forget about it <laughs> I, how many Bitcoins does someone have to pay you to do their podcast intro music? <laughs> I, I, I'll give you a podcast music intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, I'll send you a couple of files. You can, you can sort of like listen through and pick whatever you want. Uh, but I want you to do the vocals though. That's really what oh, I, I don't, I don't usually sing because um, there's always people around the house, like my <laughs> daughter and, and you know, them listening to me like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't like that. It's, it's embarrassing. Could only make you more endearing to them. Oh, you know that. <laughs> my, my, my daughter already calls it like daddy music. <laughs> oh, it's daddy music. And he, he's sort of like roaring death metal. He's like, oh, it's daddy music. Has uh, your daughter painted your nails again since she massacred your nails on February 14th? Uh, no, but she did give me a manicure a couple of weeks back that was quite possibly the most painful thing I've ever experienced. Right. I'm by, by the end of it, I was bleeding from several places, but because I'm like a good dad, I just kind of uh, uh, grit my <laughs> teeth and suffer through it because she was super happy and she was quiet. And I'm just like, oh, fuck it, just take it, dude. <laughs> yeah, what well, we'll do for a little peace and quiet. Yeah, I was referring to that tweet. So uh... <laughs> uh, yeah. that's dumb. Now, do you think, who do you think did a worse job, her painting your nails or you painting the room? Oof. Probably me painting the room. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I meant to tell you this. You started a trend where like maybe the next three out of six authors I had on the show all had painted a room within like a week of doing my show. So is there something to that? Yeah, yeah. They're just, they're copycats that's what it is they, they were they were i mean so many authors watch your show you know, and they all gather around they were watching it and they were like fuck 
Fletcher painted a room. I got to one up them, man. So many authors watch the show that they forget they were ever even on it. <laughs> so I think that people are just trying to follow the Fletcher method of writing. They're like, I got to do what this guy does. I got to paint a room. <laughs> I too can be completely unheard of. <laughs> I don't think that's true. You're almost like an elder statesman of the Spiffbo finalists. Like you have more publishing experience than a majority of them. Yeah, it's, it's weird because it's... It, you know, I have such a short attention span and uh, I can't remember yesterday. Um, so it seems like I'm like, I'm super new at this. Uh, but I've got a couple of books out. I'm actually not sure how many, uh, <laughs> but I've got, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 12 books written. That's true. Two, dead minimum two are dropping in 2021 and probably three, if I don't fuck around too much. Man, that release schedule is just insane. I, say what you want. I know you haven't said the word lazy in a while, so I'm proud of you. Because yeah, it's too busy to be lazy. <laughs> that's the character switch, just 180 into like I'm the busiest man alive. That's why you can't answer Mark Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. That that dude is prolific and uh he's annoying because he's so, so ridiculously good. <laughs> you know like you read his stuff and he's just he's like a prose monster it's just like, fuck how do you write like that <laughs> no it's incredible and you know one day he'll be a guest on this show when when i one day take I, over i tried to get i tried to get him on the uh the warriors wombats and whatever the other thing. whatever the third thing is. whatever I'm like, dude like hey come on like we're gonna be super nice and it's gonna be awesome and he's like no <laughs> and that's the truth so, um do you now i meant to have you as the 10th and final spiffbo guest on this show but as i mentioned on the last time that you were on the show i'm terrible at math and your last book had a lot of math in it and I didn't appreciate that. Ah, my bad. And it turns out that you are the ninth person because I forgot about the 10th person. Uh, I mean, who's the 10th person now? Who's I who think, is not me? Um, I think it's Matt Larkin, who Matt. is someone uh, who's someone I don't have I, I don't have any contact with. I don't know. Eventually I'll get him on, hopefully. No, yeah, no, he's uh I, I've had some interaction with him uh, you know, through Spitball and stuff. Uh seems like a really good dude. Um, so how do you feel that you're now the penultimate instead of the ultimate? I never doing this shitty podcast again. Like, fuck, it's, you totally betrayed me, dude. I mean, it's career suicide to do this. <laughs> <laughs> My dream is we that a deal. we had a deal. <laughs> I mean, I did, uh, I did last time say that you signed a verbal commitment that you have to come back on whenever I ask. Oh, uh, that's true. All right, fine. <laughs> I think that that's all I got for you. Do you please plug some things that you actually plug this time? Uh, okay, of- so actual plugging. All right, so uh, She Dreams in Blood. Uh, the sequel to Blackstone Heart is coming out April 16th, as we have mentioned. I, I have a sort of nasty, noir, low fantasy, Russian-based uh, novel coming out with a uh, Clayton Snyder, author of uh, The Obsidian Psalm, uh, River of Thieves, and some other stuff. We work together uh, is going to come out uh, in May, mid-May, I think. May 10th, maybe, I think. Uh, and that's Good. that was a lot of fun. That was a weirdly fun project to write. Uh, and it is fucked up. And Clayton is just all kinds of messed up. Like, I read his, his scenes, and I'm like, dude... <laughs> How does that work where you kind of co-write a book? I, I can't, uh, I can never tell with you guys, like if that was a serious thing or not. Like I was trying to try, I'm like, are they actually doing this? Yeah. So I, the, with Clayton, yes, that's actually like for real. And basically <laughs> what we did is we, we each took a character. So there are two point of view characters in the book. We each took a character. I write one, he writes the other. Uh, and then we sort of came up with a storyline together. And like every couple of chapters, we'd stop plot out the next couple of chapters, figure out exactly what needs to happen, who needs to be where. And we just went like that through the whole book. Uh, and then, so you've got these two sort of uh, different storylines, uh, you know, and they start entirely separate. Uh, 
Um, but very quickly, you can see the sort of like kind of train wreck of characters. That sounds awesome. Is it hard to co-write a book? Uh, that one went really well. Uh, that was the first time I've ever co-written a book. Uh, and I think we got really lucky in our approach. Um, you know, I, I, it worked really well. I was, I was surprised at how easy it was. Uh, I think maybe three months, uh, we had like a hundred thousand word first draft, like banged out. And the final thing, not massively different from that. Uh, because we kept stopping and sort of tweaking, going like, okay, what's right. this thing next? And we'd edit each other's stuff. So, you know, by the time we hit the end, you know, it had already been through like kind of several editing passes. That sounds awesome. I guess that you guys, obviously, you have to get along to make that work. Otherwise, it's a nightmare. Yeah, Clay- Clayton's actually really good with me being like an insane control freak and emailing him. Like, I message him at like four in the morning. <laughs> And most, most of the responses are like, no, nah, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, but eventually he wakes up and, you know, becomes intelligible and gets back to me on whatever fucking insane random question I'm firing at him at four. Now, if I had, if he was sitting where you're sitting right now and I asked him the same question, do you think he'd give the same answer? Like, yeah, yeah Mike was a pleasure to work with. Or do you think he'd be like, oh, fuck no, he, this guy? He'd be like, oh, no, Mike is a pleasure to work with. <laughs> and he'd be just lying through his fucking teeth like i just i just loved when he texted me at 4 a.m with this question that just couldn't wait until the morning daily yeah but he did agree we're actually we're working on another book um so it wasn't too terrible for him i mean unless he's just a glutton for pain yeah which i think is probably very much the case we should be very on brand (laughs) Now, do you think if you had written this with Jed based on your antagonistic attitude towards him, you guys would kill each other by the end? Yeah, yeah, that's actually an interesting idea. Yeah, Clayton's much scarier. He's, he's about like nine feet tall. So like- That's pretty big. Actually, he's actually like, he's way scarier than I am. Like <laughs> on my scariest day ever. It's like, yeah, fuck. he's way scarier. Also, you're fucking Jed, terrifying. So I can't imagine- I'm yeah, so intimidated over here. So cute. I don't know. <laughs> I can't imagine. So that comes out May 10th. You've got audiobooks, audiobooks, audiobooks. Yeah, audiobooks. Uh, working on recording audio for She Dreams and Blood. Not sure what we're going to do with audio for Norelska Groans. Oh, that's what that May 10th book is called. Norelska Groans. Norelska is a city, uh, like sort of early industrial city in the far north of... Uh, Russia, basically. Uh, anyway, uh, so that uh, I think the very last City of Sacrifice book might drop by the end of the year. No idea what it's going to be called yet. It's got to rhyme with the first two, right? You got kind of it's a probably, title. Probably not. Probably <laughs> not rhyme. Then I'm shelving it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> very, very committed at this point. I'm deep into your uh, your books. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. I needed Twitter interaction, so I had to have you on. Um, you well, tend, if you say one thing about you, you move the needle. <laughs> that is, that's good. <laughs> thanks for having me back. You know, uh, this is, uh, it's fun to just hang out. And zero stress, zero sort of uh, expectation, and just, you know, shoot the shit. And zero it's fun. Like- <laughs> thank you. You know, I don't think that I say this enough or maybe I haven't really said it at all but it's kind of obvious that I'm a huge fan of his and something that he does that I find awesome and I really don't think he has to do it and I think he just genuinely likes helping people is he's been extremely supportive of this show since its early iterations when it was a complete mess he was a guest very early on And obviously now he's a recurring guest, but like a lot of the stuff he does off screen is extremely nice. He always retweets everything I post. He retweets a lot of authors and he's super supportive. And I just want to say that, like, I think a lot of people appreciate that and maybe it goes unheralded, but that's why I'm here. He's also a fucking wild boy.
you know, I was saying, I need intro music. And he said, I've got some shit that I'm cooking up. I'll send it to you. And I talked about that earlier, but he really did send me that. So thank you. And it was super fun having him. I think that we're going to have him and Clayton on for what I can only imagine is going to be a clusterfuck of an episode when their book comes out. And I'm super excited for that. But let's wrap this thing up. Books on the horizon. We've got Paternus by fellow Book Nest Award winning author Dirk Ashton. Songs of Insurrection by USA Today, even though he hates saying it. Best selling author JC Kong. And then Legacy of the Brightwash by future award winning author. Yes, I'm saying that now. And I'm even saying I'd be shocked. Shocked, 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 shocked if she doesn't make the finals next year for Spitbo. Author Crystal Matar. Thank you, everybody, who's been rocking with me. Support this on all your social media platforms. I know I've been posting a ton of clips on Instagram on Mikey Clips. And keep on reading. Peace!